So my name is Joe Nussbull. I'm I hail from Portland, Oregon. Uh, on the West Coast, so completely um, probably across the world. Um, I'm one of the organizers for um, DevOps Days Portland, and the I'm going to start off actually with um, sort of an intro to um, a talk that I did a while ago, and it's called uh, How to DevOps Days. So. I am a principal engineer at Workday. Um, I maintain some stuff on GitHub. I blog, not as often as I probably should, um, but as one thing I'm known for as the organizer as, is this Cowbell Joe. I'm the one who's walking around with the cowbell and I came bearing cowbells, this sort of like, um, to let people know, uh, instead of like during open spaces when the session's over, instead of like going off and saying, hey, it's time to stop, it's a little more gentle reminder, it's not so jarring of things. Um, so I wanted to talk about how to DevOps days. Now this is not how to DevOps. This is about how to DevOps days, how to get the most out of the conference, because I've had conversations with people and they're like, oh, how was the conversation, or you know, how was the conference? And they're like, meh. And I'm like, well, you're doing it wrong then. Um, that's what I always say. So first of all, I want to I want to have a, a re, you know remind people that DevOps days, these conferences is, are all volunteer run. So you know, you, the, countless hours are put in. There's all kinds of fiascos going on behind the screen, the scene that you don't see, and that we make uh, as organizers. You try to make it seamless so that the, you, the attendees, have a nice, consistent experience, and you know we stress about those things. So, please thank them. Um, it's it's a lot of hours, and you know it's uh, we do it do organizing because we love it. We 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 are really believe in it and stuff, and that's why we do it. But um, it is sort of a, a thankless job. So please thank thank them. So how do you make the most um, out of DevOps days? And I always say, first of all, relax. Um, you know, just be yourself on there and, and relax. And you know, the thing is, is that people be up here speaking and you'll sit there and look at, it, look at them and go, oh man, we are so far out of what they are, um, of what they're doing and stuff. And, and I always tell people to remind you that well, they're up here showing you their highlight reel. And you're comparing that to your blooper reel. So you're, 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 you're really, you're too hard on yourself, so relax. Remember that DevOps is a journey. It's not the destination, it's a, it's a long time thing of doing it. So, um, if you're not on Twitter, Get on Twitter, that's a good way of following people. You follow the, um, you know, you're gonna follow people, you follow the organizers, um, you're the, follow different projects you, you like and, and the sponsors. What I like about Twitter is that it's sort of like crowdsourcing for information discovery. Um, I don't have time to search out the internet for all the cool pro products out there and, and go through the signals and noise. I rely on the community to do that for me. So if I sit there and say that somebody goes, oh, hey, th have you checked this out? And I'm like, oh, hey, that sounds kind of neat. You can go through and get those pieces on there. So that's one of the, the benefits I see on that. Um, you know, talk to people. Um, that, that's the thing, that's what you're doing here. You're, you're, you're trying to figure out what people are doing. Um, you know, where you work isn't that important. It's more of what you're doing. Um, you know, just because somebody's at, you know, a big company or, or whatever, it's like, you know, other people just have as much of interesting things to say as well. Um, and just, if you make those connections, you don't know where the next, um, you know, when the next time you're looking for a job or if, when you're um, looking to make a hire. Um, if you've built a connection with somebody, you know, that helps your employment possibilities for yourself and for getting hires in. So make those connections with people. Um, this, uh, I, I, I like this photo a lot, and it's kind of hard to see what it is, but it's actually a bee on a sunflower on there. And this is really the thing, the, the idea about cross-pollination. 
getting ideas from other places and taking them to there. So my first word of advice on here is to ignore your coworkers. If you had all the answers from your coworkers, you wouldn't be here, right? I mean, you're here to get different ideas. So ignore them. Unless you're sitting there saying, oh, this is a cool open space, I'm gonna go to this one, you please go to that one. So if you're strategizing how you can get coverage, but ignore them. You can talk to them after the conference. You know, when are, when are the other chance you're gonna to get to see all, and interact with all of these people again um, until next year, hopefully, that you'll all be back. Um, so utilize the hallway track. After, con um, you know, after the talks, go and talk to the people and say, you know, oh, um, you know, you know, strike up the conversations and say about things. It's, it's really interesting um, about being able to talk to the speakers, ask them further questions. Uh, if there's Q&A and stuff, and you see somebody who asks the question, you're like, oh, well, hey, I was kind of thinking about that. Maybe they're on the similar position uh, in their journey as where we are in the transition of things. So you might be able to strategize about how you're doing things and stuff, and you're sort of in it together. This should go without saying, but it, it's surprising to me that there's only like 40 to 50% turnout for the evening events. Um, this is just a great way to continue building those relationships. Please, um, you know, I, I highly recommend that uh, on there. Uh, another thing is when you start hearing these talks, think about technique and pull out the technique instead of the implementation. Always people that'll go and sit there and say, well, I'm a Linux shop, why would I go and you know, hear this talk about Windows? And it's like, but it's the technique that you're looking at, not just the implementation. So think about those things. Try to parse out that piece of the information out of the talks. Um, I have a really bad memory about names and face. I'll recognize your face, but I'm not gonna remember your name. Here's a good way, if you're on Twitter, Take a, take a selfie, or as my kids like to call them, ussies, with somebody, and you take the picture, you tag them, so then you can go back through your Twitter feed and go, oh, it's Kobes, that's who it was. So you remember those things on there, so you can go back through your feed and you tag the people that you're in there talking to, so you know, remember who you were talking to. Um, so hashtag um, DevOps friends. Uh, and then everybody can start um, searching for those and see the people that you've met. Don't be a jerk. There, there's these comments that people make like, get a real operating system. Use a real editor and, and oh, you're using, you're using X? Well, that's your problem. You, you may think that that's funny at the time, but that stifles the conversation. If people are sitting there going, well, hey, they, you know, um, you know, so and so, uh, they're, you know, um, Jocko's using this, and people ripped on him for that, and it's like, w what am I going to do? I'm not going to speak up because they're, they, that guy's great, and people are ripping on him, and I'm not going to speak up because they're going to rip on me. You think you're funny, but it's stifling conversation. So just don't be a jerk on these things. Um, Have compassion when you're talking to the people. I see a lot of things where people are, are going through and will say things and it's like, you know, well, why are you doing that? Come on. And it's like, have compassion. Sometimes those decisions were made before somebody joined the company or they don't have the power to change it. Um, and really what you're trying to figure out and why you're coming to these things is really is, I want to make my life suck less. I mean, I'm not, I know that it's not going to be perfect, but I just want it to suck less, you know? And that's, that's the thing that you, you kind of want. You have to, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm hamstrung to this, um, to this, you know, monitoring system or whatever. We have a big investment on it, but I really need to have it not be such, such a pain to use or whatever. How do people do these things? Um, the other thing I'd like to say on here, is simple math. You've got two ears and one mouth. You should, um, 
you should listen twice as much as you speak. Um, here I'm saying this, and I'm up here on stage doing all the speaking, but uh, anyways, it's, it's, especially when you get to the open spaces and things, don't dominate the conversations. Everybody has a story to tell. Um, um, so I want you to start thinking about topics for open spaces. On there, and these are the great things that you know are, are good conversation pieces. When you're when you're proposing a topic for open spaces, you don't have to be um, an expert on it. You can be just asking the question, "I want to know more about this. Is somebody doing this?" Um, you know, and those sorts of things. So start posing the questions. Start thinking about from these. Uh, if any of the talks, if people will have you know, will spawn some ideas in there and go, oh, I want to learn more about this. So, or sharing, sharing an information, uh, information about it. This is really cool. How are people doing these sorts of things? It's not a sales pitch. Um, so don't sit there and, you know, say, well, I'm going to tell you why if you just buy, you know, the a turbo encabulator that it's just going to make your life great. So, you know, fork over money. That's not the point. It's, it's really about information sharing. All right. So I'm going to um, now switch gears and flip over to, come on. All right. So I'm actually going to now switch gears into my the, my keynote. After I've like, I wanted to do the how to DevOps days first, so you can like have a great experience. So switching gears now. Um, um, so the name of my talk is, um, you know, is reflections on a lifetime of learning, and this this really is the idea of we're constantly learning and constantly thinking about things. Um, because people always ask, you know, well, you know, DevOps, how did you learn these things? Or, you know, how did you get good at these things? And so, um, and this is just, it's a continuum. There's always new technologies and stuff, so you always have to continue learning to stay relevant. Um, so I found this quote, and it really, um, really um, struck with me on here. Um, and the whole idea... I, I guess I would have to say is, well, I'll make a confession. I'm not here to bestow wisdom upon you. Um, that's not, that's not the, the point. Um, a, um, that's preposterous. Um, that's arrogant. I don't have all the answers. And I can't tell you what will work for you. The idea of this talk is for you to um, start thinking about things in a different way and, and stuff. So your wisdom comes from your life experiences. So what your journey. So here was my journey. Um, actually, it's, it's more through Amsterdam and then down to Cape Town. But second confession of the talk, I really like maps and globes. So I always wanted to put, get one up on stage for me. So, so, uh, so I live in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and there we go, um, land of trees. Here am I with my, with my kids. Um, and so I've got, um, I've got Bashful Goth, at Bashful Goth, and then at Bubza 101. So this is an interesting thing for me um, to, to sort of think about the reflections on it. Um, when I was a kid, uh, when, I got, uh, when I turned 13, I got a 10-speed bike for my birthday. Um, that was the thing we had in the family, you got the 10-speed bike. And that meant when I went over to my friend Alan's house, who lived about six miles away, it took like a half an hour to ride there instead of like close to an hour on my, on my uh, single-speed bike. Uh, and so that was really a thing about, um, you know, being able to connect with my friends. So when my kids turned 13, what did they want? What was the big thing? Social media. And so I started thinking about it. And uh, of that, and it's like, you know, oh, the times have changed. And I'm like, no, if you start reflecting on what, what, why it is, what they're doing, it's really about connecting to their friends. So it's no different um, than, what it, uh, than 
what I had as, as a kid. So it was starting me thinking about this and reflecting on the things and looking at not the, the mechanics of it or uh, of various things, but really what is the core principle of that and what they're looking for. So, you know, one of the things in, in, your, you know, in the technical field, you know, you have post-mortems or root cause analysis or whatever, um, your organization calls it, it's really trying to find out where, why, where did we come from? Where did we get the, where did we get here? So if we look at, if we look at, you know, if I look at my journey and say, where did I learn all this stuff about DevOps and stuff? And so I, if I look at the root cause, it's this guy, my dad, Joe Senior. So an accountant by trade, um, not, you know, wasn't in, uh, in computer field or anything, but he taught me so much about it. Uh, and all of these lessons are just things that um, I didn't know that there were lessons yet. It's only in, in reflecting on them that I understood what these things were that I was learning. So I remember going with my dad um, to get an oil change in his car. And truth be told, third confession of the talk, I really went with him because I knew I was going to get Burger King on the way home. I mean, you know, I, I don't want to go to the, the, the shop or whatever. But here, here's what the, the, um, the stickers were that they used to have in the cars. And they had the date and the mileage. And it was the date that you brought the car in. And the mileage, they wrote down the mileage of when it was. And my dad would sat there, and I remember him getting vehement with the person, arguing with them. They put it on there, and he's like, no, 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 no. Write the date plus three months on there. So you're supposed to take your car in every three months at 3,000 miles. And he's like, and he's like no, 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 no. Um, he's like, no, we do this. So he was really adamant about there, and he, uh, he was like, I don't want to have to sit there every time I look down and do math in my head. I want to make it easier on myself. So that really kind of, you know, that, that lesson stuck with me of sort of like pre-computing things or making things easier on yourself. So if you look back now, um, you have these are the new style of things where it actually says when your next service is due. Um, was that due to my dad? Probably not, but it sort of got the idea going about um, I was thinking about this was just about the, one of the lessons I learned also that day was question the standard operating procedures of things. Just because you've done everything this way all the time, think about it. Is it easy? Is it easy on there? Um, the other lesson I learned is that the old design, you were designing to make it easier on you, the, the producer of it, instead of your consumer. If you're only thinking about what's easy for you to do, you're missing the, the boat. You want to make your consumer of whatever technology you're doing, you want to make it easy for them to do. So, um, so oil changes taught me a lot about DevOps days. I mean, about DevOps, sorry. So the other thing that, um, that we did is, um, so my family is um, German by descent, so made sauce. It was, you know, several times a year, our kitchen was transformed into sausage. Um, we would be making sausage in there. And I was trying to look at a, a quote for sausage, and it's always about, you know, politics or something. It's sort of like, you know, politics is like sausage. You don't want to see, you know, things being made and stuff. And I'm like, Ugh. and I'm like, I take great pride in my sausage making of, of things, so it's like, it's always ripping on this. And this is sort of like a, a good quote that I found. Um, you get out of it what you put in. So just to set the stage on here, I'm gonna give you a lesson, a short lesson on, on sausage making. So first you trim the meat, grind the meat, you mix in the spices you form, and most importantly, cook and enjoy. This is a sausage press. 
So when you grind up the meat, you mix in the spices, you put the meat in there, uh, the meat in the thing, you close, and then you crank that, and, and it, the meat comes uh, extruding out. So just setting the stage for this to, so you can understand the next picture. So this is what it looks like at the Nussbull, the Nussbull kitchen um, during when you're making sausage. Um, multiple people are working. And this is a really great um, allegory for sort of um, uh, you know, tech delivery of things. It's like, um, you know, you can sort of think of like the sausage press as development going through. They can crank out the stuff and things are going through, but um, you're sort of rate limited of what your organization can handle. Because if you crank too fast, what's going to happen is the casings of the sausage are going to burst and you're going to have meat all over, your, all over the table. So really, th this sort of thing reinforced to me about pipelines are important. Every person in the pipeline has a specific job to do. And you are sort of like limited on your whole pipeline that is limited on the slowest person in that pipeline. So if here my dad who's measuring off the sausages and then and turning them, um, if he's going slow, well, um, on there, my youngest is, is actually rolling up the sausage in this picture. They, can, they can't consume it any, any faster because you're sort of rate limited by my dad. Or my, my nephew, Macklin, is sitting there cranking away, and he can't crank faster than what my dad can do. So you have to think about, and this is a real good thing of understanding the importance of pipelines and going through there. And so all of these lessons that I have have sort of like really built into the notion of reinforced these concepts that in DevOps you, and you know, in, in the computer industry as well, you, you know about these things. And, but they, they just really drove home for me when I was thinking about this. But you know, just everybody has an, a role in your pipeline. Uh, and um, and they're all important. So you can't skimp on, you know, dev can't do anything without, um, without your QA, the QA or operations and, and things like that. So that's sort of, um, you know, one thing on there. So, so they always have a thing about, you know, teaching people. How do you teach people? And, you know, the, the quote from ben, Benjamin Franklin, Tell me and I'll forget. Show me and I may remember. Involve me and I will learn. So here's Bashful Goth at Bashful Goth. Um, actually, you know, working on there. This is your junior developer. Give them the responsibility. How are they going to learn the things? Of saying, uh, you know, you, you sit there and you give them the responsibility of doing things. Um, you have to give them the opportunity to grow. Um, let them take on the responsibilities that they, they can. And put it into an environment where it's safe for them to succeed. You don't want to take your junior developers and have them set them up for failure. You want to grow them. Give them the confidence that they can go on and do, um, that they will succeed. Um, because you really do want to grow your, the new members of your team and your junior developers so um, they can start being on call. And not just you. <laughs> um, and you know, if they make a mistake, you explain to why um, certain things are done away. So, I've ground the sausage. I've got this. I've got the spices on there. So this is sort of like DevOps. You can't just sprinkle it on top, and then your organization is great. Um, you really have to ingrain it into your organization, um, because although you could like, you know, cook this up, you got this. The, uh, you know, there's brown sugar in there. Uh, you're going to fry that up, and well, it's going to probably burn and stuff. It may taste great, but that piece of it, but the rest of it is not, is not going to. So you really have to um, think about 
It has to be throughout your organization. So you mix things up together, and your teams will start organizing um, on here. So yeah, so you mix it up, and then it becomes this the whole mess when you start your tra you know you start transforming, and then something becomes ordered, and you actually start looking about what you want to to have. So the other thing that I did growing up that really taught me a lot was I worked as a, um, a, in carpentry. So this was a sign in my high school wood shop. It said on there. And I always liked that. I always thought that, that quote was funny. It's like, you know, I cut it twice and it's still too short. And I'm like, well, of course you, you cut a board and if you cut the... No. I've cut two pieces of wood, and both times they're still short, too short. But anyways, it's just kind of a funny thing. It was like, um, you know, uh, it was in the wood shop. It held over the door of things. So um, this really taught me, um, you know, various things. One of them is um, there's sort of two things. One of the fundamental things in, in, in carpentry is, you know, you measure things out. Um, so that's the thing you'll say is um, throughout anything that you're doing, measure what you're doing. That's the only way that you can actually tell if you're making a difference or whatever. Um, the other thing on here I, I like is out of this, there are two things on here. This close up over here, they're starting on, I don't know why, on, on this particular one. Um, you know, maybe um, the tape measure is broken, but. The idea of having a good ba baseline from where you start your measurements or, or things like that. Have a baseline and do your measurements from that. Um, a good illustration of that instead of just making guesses. You have to sit there and say, well, measure things, have your baseline, and did I make an improvement or not? This was my, this was the same model as my dad's uh, saw that we had in our garage shop. So uh, this radial arm saw was a beast on there. Um, when I was growing up, I remember in the house when my dad would be out there, he'd flip it on and the amp draw would dim the lights in the house and, and stuff because uh, where we lived out in the, out in the country, you know, those old you know, the power and stuff. So we thought, oh, you know, that's just our circuit breaker or whatever. I was down uh, later, you know, a few years later, I remember I was down at a, at a neighbor's house and my dad was doing something and their lights dimmed. And I could hear the saw in the background. I'm like, oh man, we're not just affecting, when he flips on the saw, he's not just affecting us. He's affecting our neighbors too because it's drawing so many amps. On there, so the the, the notion of is uh, what really this got me thinking about was that you may think that you're only affecting yourselves, but you might have effects on others. So keep that in mind. One of the things in the big things in carpentry is doing prototypes. Uh, you sort of like build something together. Um, see that it's going to work um, beforehand. Um, usually when you're making a prototype of things, of getting an idea of stuff, you're using scrap metal, or I mean not scrap metal, but um, scrap wood. Um, you know, ends, um, cut off pieces, usually mismatch things. Um, so you're just getting an idea of, is this going to work? Is it going to put together and build? Before you actually get out the, get out the good wood, the stuff that's going to be you know, pretty expensive to make. When you're having your, your fine furniture, you want that, but if you're just gonna be like, oh, is this gonna fit or whatever together, you don't wanna use the good stuff because if it doesn't, well, you're out the money. So this really gave me the idea of prototypes and thinking about, um, you know, making sure that things fit together before you, um, you, know, before you actually start assembling it. And the, the idea, this is a common thing in, in, in carpentry is, is dry fitting things together. 
Um, so you're, you're, building some, you're building your systems and you're gonna try to put them together and you, you make sure that they're, they're going to fit together before you really solidify what things are. Because I like that. There, there's been a time. There's been a few times where I've I've done things and not thinking about things or being distracted by things and like glued on a panel backwards, and it's like ah. Oh. And then you're sitting there pounding them out. You're usually wrecking it and having to redo it. So think about things, making sure everything fits together before you really solidify it and ingrain things into what you're doing. So does anybody know what this is? So it is a jig. So it's a, uh, so there's a, th there's a thing when you're, when you're making, when you're cutting wood. So if you need one piece, you just measure and cut. So if you need two pieces, the exact same, you measure, you measure one piece of, of wood and you cut it. Uh, and then you'll take the board and put that on top. And so you've got two boards on top of each other and then you cut so they're exactly the same. If you're, if you're making something, you only have to make two cuts. It's the way you do it. So then you don't have to measure two things and be off. Now, if you have to make 100 cuts, you don't want to be measuring every single one of those things and doing that. So you measure one, you set up a jig such that this is a stop block on here, jig. So what you do is, it, this is measured out from the saw to where the cut is going to be. So you spend a lot of time making jigs or things like that, such that you can go on autopilot when you're making those 100 cuts. You, you spent all the time up front doing this, and then when you're going through these things, you can just put the wood in, cut, keep on going through, cycling through those things. Um, this is something about automation. Um, you know, automation, you spend a lot of time up front doing the automation, such that it may be um, a lot of time to come up and do your first thing. But overall, it's gonna be your hundredth, you know, the, the time when you have to, the hundredth machine that you have to automate and do the same thing. So I learned the ideas of having to do automation uh, of why it's so important because of these things. Um, the other thing with, um, so on there is that, you know, once you get on there is like you're, you're doing an autopilot. You can think about those things or um, you can stop and come back to it. Um, if you're having to, you can, you can walk away and come back from it. But the idea on there is just that, um, yeah, you're, you're doing it um, once and you're doing that all up front. You're making it easier on yourself. So, you know, and it, this is just doesn't, you know, it, it, there's various things of, of ways that you can do that. I've, I remember building a fence with my dad and we set it up such that we could, it was all slotted out. We were making uh, probably about almost 300 feet of fence and all these panels we were making. And so we built something that you could just lay all the slats down, lay the thing across, and then just boom, boom, boom with a, with a nailer. And it took us a while to do it, but we could crank out one of those sections in probably 10 minutes once you had that initial thing on there. So we're making 30, you know, 36 sections, and so it was making it much easier to go through and do that. So those upfront costs will pay off in the end for you. So this is something I made this summer. I was building at a summer camp. And we were doing a wood project, and this is at the beach, and this is a towel rack. So towels aren't that heavy. Why are, you know, why are, you re why are we reinforcing it, the towel racks? I mean, it's not going to be that heavy on there. Well, 
thing about this is to discover, thought about rather quickly on this is like, there's 300 boys between 12 and 18 at this summer camp. You don't think somebody's gonna be up there trying to do chin-ups on it or something like that? So yes, um, you, you, you kind of have to build it to handle some stresses. It's gonna get, things that you do are gonna get abused uh, on there. And, you know, it doesn't always have to be pretty. One of the other things I did uh, the, this summer is that uh, the boys were working on a, uh, a woodworking merit badge and they built, every week they were building picnic tables. And when we got there, and they said, uh, it's like, can you fix the picnic tables that the boys made? Um, it's kind of hard to see on here, but this is actually, I, I fixed this. This is where the actual screw holes were. So you were sitting about this level <laughs> on the ground, and like here, you could rest your chin on top of the picnic table. So they measured incorrectly, the boys that were doing it. But still, it was like, when I was thinking about this and, and building this up and coming up with these slides, I was like thinking about, you know, if you make a mistake on what you're doing, you can adjust it. You're thinking about, you know, sort of the function over form. It doesn't have to be perfect. We could have thrown out this, this, uh, this picnic table, but it's gonna get abused by the boys and they're probably gonna be etching in their initials with a knife on it and, or whatnot on there, but it's, you still have the form. It's, it's, it, you're not concerned about the form, it's the function. Can you sit at the table and can you use it? It doesn't have to be pretty. So sometimes when you're building things, you know, think about that. Is, does it have the function over, over, is it truly elegant of things? Because at the end of the day, People are going to want a place to sit. They don't care how pretty it is. So, we built a gate and we did all kinds of very interesting things. This is actually self, the way we balanced it, it's self closing on there. And that's, that was pretty cool um, on there. But one of the boys was saying on there was self closing. It's like, well, you know, should we have a stop on it? Because it's gonna, you know, if the wind blows, it's gonna, uh, although we have a latch, it's gonna like move back and forth. And I'm like, okay, yeah, maybe. I don't know, how would you build that? So we just, this, this was actually built up, um, um, the, the actual stops that go down. Here was built by, uh, was figured out by a, by a 14 year old boy, he was like, I saw some rebar. We could like bend it and use that. So again, this kind of like had the idea of, you know, trust in your junior developers to come up with solutions um, you may not think of. Again, uh, it goes back to really about thinking about what are, what are your requirements and does it have to be an elegant thing or does it just need to work? for those things. So um, it's surprising when you give people the opportunity um, to grow, they usually surprise you in what it, when it was. Throughout the stuff that I learned from my father and such, the overall sort of guiding principle that I, I've come over the years is what I like to term the simplicity principle. You should make it easy to do the right thing. You're steering people to do the right thing. And you make it really difficult for them to do the wrong thing. If you think about safety systems and such like that, if it's really easy to do something wrong, no, 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 you've, you've designed it poorly. Um, because you don't want those things, um, uh, you, know, you know, guards on a saw to keep you from cutting your fingers off and things like that. They're there for a reason. And it's like, so for you to actually be dangerous, 
by taking the guard off. It's really difficult on saws to do that, to take the guards off. So this, this is another thing I, I like to think about when I'm designing things, is you're just trying to steer people to do the right thing, and that's another, uh, to do the right thing. Um, so make it easy for them, so they'll, they'll, be, po you know, they'll ha be successful. So, I have another story that I'm going to sort of leave, leave with, and it's, it's sort of an idea uh, is being poised for success. Now, uh, the funny, funny th a funny story about the story is that I was actually was talking about this situation, um, and at, at my work, we use Chef for configuration management. And I was talking to, I, I was relating the, the story and some people at Chef, they got it and um, they started using it. And then the sales guy came out and he started ta telling me a story about automation, the importance of automation. And he was telling, he was telling me my story. I thought that was, it was kind of fun, funny on there. But um, so, So the idea of being poised for success. Um, if you're doing a, a transformation, you have to be ready um, to step in and be ready to show the benefits of things, of everything we're learning in here. And so does anybody remember shell shock, the bash vulnerability? So you had to go through and like, um, had the patch, have a new version of bash actually, and then they had another, they promptly released another patch on there because they found the same vulnerability in a different piece of code about um, the inv uh, how it was handling environment variables. So I remember this was at the beginning of sort of our um, chefization, if you will. Uh, and I remember it came out and we were building a new, uh, my team was doing um, the the automation in Chef uh, for a new data center, and the legacy, our legacy data, data centers were being handled. They were um, being handled differently, and so there's this big team that we got, you know, this big team together, and they were saying, going through different groups about handling different environments. Well, how long is it going to take? You know, can you give me an estimate of when this work's going to be done so we can patch bash on all these machines? So I'm sitting there going through the thing and I'm like coded up um, while I'm sitting here on this conference call with like 25 people in it. They're going through and got all these project managers and stuff on there trying to come up with schedules. So I'm sitting there going, uh, I had coded up a, the recipe to deploy the new version of Bash. I, got, I had tested it on Vagrant had it code reviewed, had pushed it to our lab environment all in the time of this, uh, of this conversation, you know, uh, in this meeting. So, and then I was like, okay, and then I got approval and had it pushed out to the data center that we're building. So um, this was before the data center was online. And so they came to me, I was the last one in the group, and they said, so when is it gonna be ready? When you, or when will you have an estimate for me? And I'm like, I'm done. Oh, okay, well then what's your estimate <laughs> on, on when you're gonna be ready for it? I'm like, no, 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 I'm done. It's deployed. Our, our new, the new data center is, is all done. It's like, what do you mean it's all done? I'm like, it's complete. We pushed it out, all the machines are patched. And in that time, the vulnerability was fixed. And so, they were like, wait a minute, you're already done? Yes, because I was, the thing was, was poised for success. So at this point, they were like, okay, so you're done. Y yes, I'm, I'm done. It's not gonna take a while to figure out a plan of doing it, it's, it's already complete. So if it wasn't like an hour later, I was getting emails from people and calls from people that were working on the legacy stuff and they're like, so tell me about this chef stuff. Because instead of it taking a long time, 
um, it was a thing of saying, here we are. Um, you know, I, I had a prime example of showing to them what the benefit of doing these sorts of things are. So as you're doing this transformation, keep that in mind that you, there's going to be those opportunities that you have that you can sit there and show them the DevOps secret sauce, and then they're going to get it, and then, then people are more likely to adopt it. So there's a, there's a great quote from Steve Jobs. He was giving the commencement address at Stanford University. He was talking about things. And I was thinking about, I, I really like this. I was thinking about this. And he goes, he's saying, there's events that are going to happen. And you, you, don't, you, you don't see him looking forward because you can't look into the future. So you can only look and back and connect the dots looking backwards and say, because of this, this, and it went all the way back. And so when I was looking at my, my journey of, of various things, it had already taken me all the way back to my childhood and to things that my dad had said. So what I want to, to give you an idea is that your experiences over the years are building up that foundation and you're gonna be able to apply that. You just have to look at those things and understand um, what those, those pieces are and those experience are giving you um, how to move the path to move forward. And so I hope that in several years time, one of the dots you're gonna look back and say, we got here was DevOps Days Cape Town. You got to learn these th things on here. So um, thank you.